This is where we love to come. And so we're very happy to see all of you here tonight. Appreciate the wolf so very much. Always good to see Sister Sharp. We love her dearly. She's been a part of our life for a long time. And we love her very much. All right, Malachi 3.16. It says, Malachi 3.16, Then they that feared the Lord. Anybody here fear the Lord? Amen. Yes. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. Yes. Brother Wolf, they were talking to each other. They were testifying. Mm -hmm. They were talking about God. Yeah. Yes. Never has there been a time in the history of humankind Ooh. when there is more communication. I just told you, I'm, I'm in India and the Philippines and say, listen, we, and I know it may be Instagram and YouTube and all that, but, but we're telling one another what God's doing on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. Now watch this. Watch this. He said, they, the, those of your Lord spake all to one another, and the Lord hearkened. I did my homework. Whew. That word hearkened means He rushed to the scene and paid attention. Yeah. He came running to where they were and listened intently. And in the next words, let us know that. And heard it. And a book of remembrance uh, was written before him for them. Somebody's got a real physical Bible. Is there a real Bible laying anywhere? Right there on the front row. Right there on the front row. Hand me that Bible, brother. Thank you. He wrote it for you. Yes. yes. Amen. He had a book of remembrance yes. written for you. Amen. Amen. He had a book of remembrance written. Yes. Ooh, hallelujah. He wants to remind you. Yes, he does. Behold, I am the Lord, and there's Amen. none beside me. There's Amen. none like that. I alone and by myself. Amen. Somebody, you ready to help me preach now? Yeah, man. Come on, man. And and those that feared him and thought upon his name Amen. could have this physical book of remembrance. My favorite. Oh, and I know you're still standing. I'm gonna pray. Let's just sit down, but. My favorite all-time place in the Bible. David said to, the, to the, the, the one who was there making the proclamation about what Saul said he would do to the man that defeated this giant Goliath. David looked at him and said, Tell me one more time. Yes. <laughs> I hope that before you leave this room tonight, you're going to have that tell me one more time yeah. ringing yeah. in your spirit. Yeah. I'm hoping that somebody's going to catch yeah. the, the message tonight and leave here saying, just tell me again what God's going to do yeah. for those that are... Yeah. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity. I thank you, Jesus, for my sweet friends and wolves. I thank you for all the sweet people in this room. God, I thank you for all the interneters that are going to see this live on the internet. God bless you tonight. Now, Lord, I pray for a special mantle of anointing to be about my mind. Let every word be a word of life and of liberty to the hearers in this place. Let us be lifted up in our inner man, blessed to be and filled with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, put your Bibles away. Put your hands together. Shout yes to the Lord. Come on, let's put some praise up. Let's put some praise up. just me, because I'm all excited about being here, yeah. or if it's just a little toasty in here, but i got to get out of this coat. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Are y'all ready? Amen. Are you excited about Jesus? Yes. Me too. I want to talk to you today about remembrance. Remembrance. It was Timothy who became the hands and feet, eyes and ears 
of our beloved Apostle Paul in his latter ministry. Uh, the theologians and the, 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 the legendary writers believe that the bulk of Paul's writings in his last days were at the hand of his servant Timothy. And so it was that in the second chapter of Timothy, chapter 1, verse 6, at the very uh, early outsetting of that second epistle, he says to his young charge, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, yes. which is in thee, yes. watch this now, by the putting on of my hands. Yes. Paul said, Timothy, I know it's in there because I was there when you got it. I heard you talking to me. My hand was on your head. And he said, Timothy, there comes a time in your life Come on, when trials come, when challenges come, that you've got to reach down deep and just stir up that gift. Remind yourself, hey, I'm not in this by myself. i got Jesus on the inside of me. Come on, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I can do this. So when I began to develop this, this line of thinking, this, this remembrance, this hit the rewind button message, I went to the Psalms and began to look. And I found in Psalm 77, and we're just going to walk down through it here. Pastor will put it on the overhead for me. Uh, this man is uh, talking directly to God. In fact, he says, I cried, I cried unto God with my voice. Now that's pretty descriptive. He wasn't meditating. He wasn't thinking about it. He didn't write him an epistle. He opened up his mouth. He verbalized his thoughts. And he said, God, hey God, it's me. I need some help over here. Even unto God with my voice. And he gave ear unto me. Now folks, that's the second verse that we found here already tonight. Where it is very clear that God intentionally listens to our words. Yeah. Our words are powerful. Yeah. Our words are important. God's listening to the words coming out of my mouth. Amen. Yeah. And he said, in the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. <laughs> my sore ran in the night and it ceased not. Translation. I was praying that God would give me some relief, but no relief came. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God. Can you imagine that? Now, now let's get the picture. It's dark. It's fearful. He's crying out to God. He's got a condition there's no answer for. He's desperate for divine intervention in his life. And he said, and I remembered the Lord. Look at the next words that come out of his mouth. And I was troubled. Yes. The very idea. He's crying out to God. He's in pain. He can't be comforted. There's no comfort outside of God for him. And he says, and when I remembered God, I went, oh no. Come on. Come on, get real, folks. That's it. This is the real world. This is the real life. This, this, is not a, this is not a made up story. This is, this is a guy writing about uh, an institution where it happened to him. Yes, sir. He said, I, I got even more concerned. Uh -huh. And he said, Watch this. Watch this. I complained. Ain't that just like us? Come on, just be honest. Once in your life, before you die. One of the first things that comes in your brain matter is, why is this happening to me, God? Why do I got to go through this? God, what? Preach it. Oh, evidently, y'all ain't like me. Yes. <laughs> Watch this now. I complained, and my spirit was overwhelmed. If you're tired of being depressed, oppressed, feeling like there's no way out, stop complaining. Right. 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 
Cause and effect. That's what's wrong with our country right now. Right. It's these people that are doing all these crazy things, all these dumb things that they're getting away with right now, but judgment's coming. Right. They have no correlation to cause and effect. Uh -huh. Yes, that's right. Light a fire, get burned. Right. Step in front of a car, get ran over. <laughs> Come to Texas, get shot. Okay, what do I say? <laughs> That was from Brother Wolf. <laughs> Look at this next words. He said, Thou holdest my eyes waking. What a powerful picture of prose. He just said, Bishop, I had a sleepless night. I didn't sleep a wink. I could not. I tried to get a little sleep rest and it just wouldn't come. Am I the only one that's had a sleepless night? Right. Now, folks, I'm going to be honest with you. We're getting ready to want to just run a lap and shout. It just may be a few more minutes before we get there. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> he said, I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I mean, it went from bad to worse. He complained. He got depressed. Then he couldn't sleep. And now he can't talk. Come on, am I the only one that's been in a desperate situation and I wanted to pray, but I just didn't quite know where to begin? I'm just trying to help somebody right now. Let me tell you the darkest moment in the life of any human being. I'm looking at you. Listen to the words coming out of my mouth. It's that moment from thinking, I ought to pray. I think I should pray. I want to pray. I intend to pray. And the moment you actually pray. Because if you stop and think about it, there's a lot of moments when you ought to pray, should have prayed, thought about praying, intended to pray, but you never quite got to the prayer. That's the darkest moment. If you'll stop thinking about it, meditating about it, and just open your mouth and say, Jesus, I don't know how, I don't know why, I don't know when, I don't know where, but Jesus, I know you. I know your name is powerful. I, I know your promises are true. Come on, every promise in him is yea and amen. So, so he's, he's He's yeah. walking down through here. Now watch this. Watch yes, this. Yes. He said, I'm so troubled I can't even speak. He said, I have considered the days of old. <laughs> now church, this is the most powerful thing I'm going to say in your hearing tonight. And if you will pay attention, I'm getting ready to help you a lot. Get your eyes off of your problems, your wounds, your hurts, your disappointments, and lift your eyes just a little further and look just a little further back into the history and start remembering, hey, God brought me through worse times than this. I've been dark. I, come, on, come on, I've been through. I've tried bigger hills than this. I've swam bigger hills than this. I've been through deeper valleys than this. this. He said, I call to remembrance. Here we go. My song in the night. You know what he just said? My last sleepless night, my last dark trial, my last terrible day of trouble, God brought me a song. And I started remembering, what was that song? Oh, if God be for us, who can be against us? Somebody get ready to help me. Hey, they that believe shall receive and shall speak with tongues. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They will speak in tongues. They will cast out devils in my hands. Hey, upon this rock I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail again. So I've come to challenge all of us in this day of crisis, in this day of calamity, when we're watching family members. My sister just got out of the hospital. 
She, she, she has been on a five week downward spiral with this COVID thing. It's real. She is a cancer survivor. She just had shoulder surgery. She had double pneumonia and bronchitis and the COVID still couldn't kill her because prayer was made. I'm just saying, don't complain, pray. Come on, don't. There's nobody in here who's ever had God fail them. Never failed me. And so he said, I, I began to remember my night song. I communed with my own heart. My spirit made diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever? And everybody said, oh, There we go. Come on. Hey. Will he will he be will he be favorable no more? No. Come on. Is his mercy clean gone forever? No. Does his promise fail evermore? No. Hath God forgotten to be gracious? No. Never. Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Of course not. So I said, this is just my infirmity. Come on, this is just my headache talking. Come on, I'm just trying to help somebody now. This is just my... Come on. Yes. Come on. But I'm going to remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I'm going to remember the works of the Lord. Surely, I will remember thy wonders of old. I've come to tell somebody, take a walk down memory lane. Remember when God was good. Remember when God was gracious. Remember when God was kind. Remember when God delivered. Remember when God saved. Remember when God healed. Remember when God brought you through. Remember when God supplied. Thank you. Are you going to let me preach tonight? That was, that was the introduction. I'm ready if y'all are. Okay, come on. I, uh, whew, brings me to my point. Timothy, listen. He was at a moment in his own personal human history when he was facing the greatest challenge of a lifetime. Yes. Nero had taken charge of Jerusalem. The Roman Empire was posturing, politicizing, preparing to crush Bethlehem and destroy Judea. His mentor is in chains, lowered down into a knee-deep muddy pit and left there for days on end. And he comes and hollers down, Teacher, do you yet live? And the teacher says, write this down. Come on. I'm not making that up. That's just exact. That's a, that, is a, that is a pure narrative of what was going on. Write this down. And Timothy said, I've got my paper. I've got my pencil. What is it, teacher? Timothy, I bring thee into remembrance. Ah. Stir up that gift Woo. that is in thee by the laying on of my hands. Timothy, I want to remind you of something. You're not the only one that's got the Holy Ghost. You're not the only one filled with that faith. It was in your mouth and it was in your grandmother. I've come to tell somebody you've got heritage, you've got history. You're not the only one living this life. I've probably told you this story before, but it's worth telling again. <laughs> I don't know who put this stool up here, but thank you. <laughs> I'm not sitting down for emphasis. I'm sitting down because I'm tired. <laughs> Amen. Can I keep the kids together? Is this okay? Can I just I got some stuff to tell you tonight. Listen. Timothy had heritage. Yes, sir. We have heritage. Yes, we do. Amen. I can remember we lived in Temple, Texas. And the job that I had was sending me to McGregor, Texas. Once a week, just happened to be on Wednesdays. 
Every Wednesday, I'd go spend the day in McGregor, Texas. And had an aunt and uncle who lived there. Uncle Bill and Aunt Mary. Also, my sweet cousin Debbie and her grandmother, Doris. And uh, they all lived right there on the main road. I drove by their house several times a day. And so, I'd drive over to the little church over on Adams. No, it's not on Adams. That's in Temple. That, that church is on... Uh, I can't remember the name of the street now. I could take you to it if I was there. Went there as just a boy. And uh, I'd go by that church and there was a little travel trailer sitting in the middle of the churchyard. I mean, literally parked in the middle of the churchyard. Not back behind the building, not over, no. I mean, they paralleled it right in the middle of the churchyard. I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> and uh, Brother B.B. Tomlin, I don't know if y'all ever knew that man or not. Uh, he didn't start pastoring until he was 55. He was a young man. I didn't think that then. <laughs> That's 30 years ago <laughs> or more. And so I started going by and I'd stop at their little trailer. It seemed like I was always there right about lunchtime. <laughs> Sister Tomlin was a good cook. And she got to where she was expecting me. She'd cook a little extra for me. I don't know how much Brother Tom would appreciate it, but I sure did. And so I got to going by and I got to telling them, Sister Sharp, you know, I got an aunt and uncle that live in this town. If you'd let me come preach a revival, I think they'd come hear me. I did that week after week after week after week. Well, then after a while, I started going by and telling Uncle Bill and Aunt Mary, hey, I'm going to be preaching a revival over here for long. I had such faith. <laughs> and one day, I come driving in on a Wednesday, and we were sitting there having stove top fried cornbread fritters, and I don't know what all she had cooked that day. And he said, he always called me my childhood nickname. He said, Brother Butch! I stick, I can hear his voice. He was, he, was a, he, was a, he was a boiler maker from Houston. He retired from boiler making. He come over and started passing that little church. Well, he took a building. There wasn't no people. And he said, I, I decided I'm going to have you come preach a two-week revival. I said, well, Brother Tomlin, what kind of schedule do you want to keep? He said, we're going to do Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. In my mind, I thought, that's ten sermons. I've never preached a two-week revival. I've never preached a two-day revival. In fact, I've only got one sermon. Preached it everywhere I went. <laughs> I was going to be doing some study is what I was going to be doing. <laughs> I don't think I ever got any more sermons. I just preached that same one about ten times. But I, I'll never forget that first three nights it was so lonely. It was so barren. No Uncle Bill, no Aunt Mary, nobody. But on Sunday morning, about 15 minutes into the church service, that back door opened. Here come Uncle Bill. Aunt Mary, yeah. Grandma Doris, Woo. Cousin Debbie, yeah. yes. sat about halfway up, Woo. and I forevermore preached. I mean, I preached everything I knew. I mean, I preached hard. I mean, I preached hard. And then when it came time for the altar call, I didn't know what to do. So I just handed the microphone to Brother Tom and turned around and fell on my face and started praying. Woo. About five minutes into my prayer, Brother Tom would come over and said, Brother Butch, Brother Butch, yeah, what are we going to do? I said, what do you mean what are we going to do? Uncle Bill's at the altar. What are we going to do? I said, man, we're going to pray his carcass through the Holy Ghost. That's what we're going to do. I got up. Like I had good sense. Walked out there, talked in his ear for a few minutes, laid my hand on his head, and bam, God filled him with the Holy Ghost. Oh, yeah. yeah. Scheduled him for baptism that night. When he came to get baptized, he got baptized. Aunt Mary got baptized. Grandma Doris got baptized. She was 83 years old. And Debbie got baptized. And that week, every one of them got the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. Yeah. 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 Now, how, why am I telling that story? Well, I'm bringing it into my sermon if you just listen to the words coming out of my mouth. Come on, now. See, I was driving back from McGregor one day contemplating Uncle Bill, Aunt Mary, and 
Brother Tomlin trying to make the thing work together. And I said, God, I've always loved you. I've always had a heart for your presence. I've always wanted to be your man. And I was such a fired up young person. And God, I always sat right on the front row. And I always worshipped when I came to your house. How in the world did you let me get so far off track? How in the world did I get so messed up? And it was like a movie reel playing on the windshield of my old car. Yeah. There was that summer. That summer between my eighth grade and ninth grade year. And I left my mom's house and went and moved in with Uncle Bill for the summer. And I did not see my mother's face for 90 days. And for 90 days, I fished and hunted every day for 90 days. Never went to church, never prayed a prayer, didn't see a Bible. And God revealed to me that He took my love and my favoritism for Uncle Bill and used that to destroy my faith and lead me off to the wrong path. Uh -huh. And so driving back to Temple that day, I got mad, brother. I started pounding on the dash of that car and I started praying this prayer. Devil, you just hide and watch. I'm going to pray him through the Holy Ghost. I'm going to baptize Uncle Bill in the name of Jesus if it hair loose the governor. Jesus, I'm going to win that whole house for your glory. And it was in that moment whoo, that I had a remembrance, a flash. You see, Uncle Bill became my favorite uncle when I was just a little five-year-old boy. See, my grandmother, Bessie McCurdy, was the first woman to get the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues in all of Crawford County. And when she got old and got sick and they put her in the bed, she was bed fast for two years. Her son, Uncle Bill could not stand the idea of her being in a nursing home. And so he got her a special hospital bed and put it in his spare bedroom on 3rd Street there in Jess Radle's Dairy. And he took care of her for two years. And I would come to his house. And I'd walk down that hall, Sister Sharp, and I'd look in and see that little gray-headed lady laying there, too frail to speak, and her lips would be just a moving. Just a moving. So one day, I'll never forget this, God just took it back like, it was almost like he just, he took me back like it was in the moment. Our family had gathered. Everybody had gone outdoors cooking hot dogs and doing like families do. And it was just me and Grandma McCurdy. And I'm looking in there as I'd often do as a little five, six year old boy. And I looked in there and I saw her and she was laying there and her mouth was moving. And something possessed me. What is she doing? Why is she always moving her mouth? You can't hear nothing. She's so frail, no have no breath. And so I got me a chair. And I pushed it up to that hospital bed. And I crawled up over that little frail lady. And I stretched my little six-year-old form out over her. And I stuck my ear down to her lips. And this is what I heard coming out of her mouth. Woo. God, don't let my children Woo. be lost. God, save my grandchildren. Yeah. Fast forward 30 years. I'm now a licensed evangelist preaching for Travis Wolf in Lorena, Texas. And the doors burst open. And progeny started walking in. Cousins and nephews and nieces. And, oh, y'all don't, don't know what I'm telling you. And 13 of her progeny got the Holy Ghost in that revival. That 17 of her progeny that God reached in and saved through the hand of a little grandson that heard her say, don't let my... What are you saying? I'm saying if you've got a mom, a dad, a grandma, a grandpa, an auntie, an uncle, you just name a spouse, somebody that's been praying for you, remember, you're not in this alone. You came by this honestly. So I started preaching this now. I'm skipping five pages now. I know y'all want me to. No, I'm done. Take your time. No, brother, I'm done. <laughs> My five hour energy ran out. Oh, it's so sad.
get old. <laughs> but it sure beats the alternative. <laughs> you know, it's not get old. And you get it right. I started studying. And the first pastor of Jerusalem, the brother of Jesus, his name was James. Here's what he said. He said, there was a man just like us. And he prayed that it might not rain for three years and six months. And it rained not. Oh, but wait. He prayed again. Yeah. Yes. Amen. And the heavens brought forth their rains, and the earth brought forth their fruit. What are you saying, Brother Clemens? James wanted to remind us that it doesn't take some superhero. You don't gotta be somebody. You just gotta open your mouth and speak the word of faith and cry out and say, God. Right. Yes. So start studying <coughs> these, 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 these moments of remembrance and I'm closing with this I'm done finished over listen <laughs> Jesus said Peter yes Lord the dead don't want you to make it <laughs> boy I feel the Holy Ghost on me right now <laughs> see there was another day right here in Temple, Texas. Sister Plymouth will remember this day. It was one of the scariest moments of our young life. Corey was always kind of a, I don't know, cutting edge, forward thinking, do it his way kind of kid. And so he was just a small toddler. And Carrie was still pretty much stroller bound. We couldn't let him out of the stroller. We had to push him where he went. And so we were both struggling with putting him in the stroller at the mall right up here. And Corey took off without us. He wanted to go to the game or whatever it is he's going to. And as he began to dart towards that mall, this big, huge conversion van, like an RV, come barreling down through their way fashion they should have been going. And when she saw him, she just locked her brakes up. And he literally disappeared in front of that machine. And both of us looked with a shot look of, oh my God. And so we're both just panicked and I take off running. And when I get to the front of her van thinking I'm going to find my baby laying broken in front of that van, I look up and he's literally almost a hundred feet away at the front door of the mall. Now there is no way that a little guy with legs about that long could cover that much without some help. God had his angel go, whoop, watch this. <laughs> Come on, somebody. See, because I'll never forget. Corey would be, in fact, it happened. It happened in this room right here. Corey was down here praying one night, and they had a visiting preacher at a sexual conference, and he walked by, and he said, that's your boy? And I said, yeah. He said, the devil don't want that one to make it. Yeah. Several preachers through the years, the devil don't that want that one to make it. It always kind of made me mad. Yeah. Like newsflash, loser, he don't want anybody to make it. I'm just saying. Yeah. That's right. You're right. Huh. Over and over and over again, we watch God preserve him, procure him. I don't want to be too personal, but. I can remember getting a call from a marine base way over on the East Coast and the number one commanding officer of the entire marine contingency of that area was on the phone saying, Reverend, I got your boy here. I just wrote a letter to the President of the United States of America. We ain't never broke this rule. We've got a no tolerance rule. But what your boy did, he did on my watch. His commanding officer took him out to a party and he did something he wasn't supposed to do and they want me to throw him out and I am personally appealing to the President of the United States to let him stay in. And I'm on the other end of that phone. And it's decision time. 
Do I let him continue going down the path of brokenness? Or do I assert my pastoral and fatherly control and say, wait a minute. And I said, sir, I can't tell you how proud I am that you think that much of my son. And I appreciate what you're thinking of doing. But sir, I'm asking you as his father to please rescind that letter and let me come get my boy. Because he never was supposed to be a Marine to start with. He's supposed to be a preacher. Uh -huh. And that man said, Mr. Clemens, you have it on my word of authority. He won't leave this base till you come get him. And he didn't leave the base. He was he it was actually in the man's office when Sister Clemens and Court Carey got there and they picked him up and brought him home. I'm trying to tell you, God's done some incredible stuff in yes. my lifetime, in yes. my past, and I'm not going to forget yes. it. And I think if you'll take a look over your shoulder, some of the rest of you in this room could say, yeah, I remember when God, I remember when that bullet just buried him. I remember when that, that I... Stand with me, I'm done. So, Pastor James says, a man just like us. <laughs> Changed destiny in the trajectory of a soul. And then he said, Jesus said, Peter, devil don't want you to make it. He goes, sift you like wheat. But Peter, I've prayed. Yes. <laughs> For you. Yeah. Wait, yeah. wait, 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 wait. That your faith would not fail. Now here we go. This is the punchline. Are y'all listening to me? After thou art converted. Yeah. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. Yes. While we were yet sinners, Christ loved. Come on. Yes. Ooh. He yes. wasn't even converted yet, and he was on Jesus Christ's personal prayer list. But wait, there's more. Yes. <laughs> I'm done, I promise. Mm -hmm. He said, Peter, I didn't quit with you. Uh -huh. I went ahead and looked 2,000 years down life's journey, uh -huh. and I prayed for all of those that would believe at your words. Sister Sharp, that means that Jesus personally prayed for you and for you. And if you're in this room because you believe the Acts 238 message, Jesus prayed for your faith that it will not fail after your personal conversion. You haven't prayed. You haven't read your Bible. You haven't done what you should have done. You, you ain't got no right to have no faith right now. You can say, yeah, but 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ personally said, Father, I pray that you would let his faith sustain. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I don't know what y'all been doing during this socially isolated, segregated, incarcerated time. But if you want me to lay hands on you, I got a mask with me. I'm going to put my mask on. I'm not going to get right up in your face. I'll talk to the back of your heads. But I believe in the laying on of hands. Yes. And I absolutely refuse to let the devil or any 